Welcome back to the School of Muscle. Today, we have on Jackson Pios. And Jackson is a PhD candidate. So the dude knows what he's talking about. He's about halfway through getting his PhD. So he's going to get his PhD. So we can call him soon to be Dr. Jackson. And in this episode, it's all about diet breaks, refeeds, intermittent dieting versus linear dieting, what to do after a diet break, how you should handle your training during a diet break. Should you deload? Should you just ramp volume up? What should you do there? We discuss a lot of stuff in this episode, Jackson does an amazing job, and without further ado, Jackson Pios. To get everybody on the same page here, to kind of, you know, make sure everybody knows what we're talking about, if you would want to just kind of define what we're talking about when we're saying intermittent dieting versus linear dieting and things like that. Mm. So essentially what we have is two sides here. We have intermittent diet and a continuous diet. Um, now a continuous diet is what we'd consider to be sort of your tradi traditional method of dieting. And, and what that entails is um, a person is eating below their weight maintenance energy requirements every day for the duration of the weight loss phase. Um, so, so that's the sort of type of dieting where we talk about an energy deficit, which is a difference between what you're currently eating and the amount that you would need to eat to maintain your body weight. So they're eating an energy deficit every day um, for the duration of the weight loss phase, whether that's 8, 12, 15 weeks or whatnot. Um, and that's sort of the tra traditional standard um, way that most people have been doing things um, in sort of sports nutrition for, for a long time. Um, on the other side of the coin, we have this sort of new method um, that's starting to gain a little bit of, of research attention, and that's what we call intermittent dieting or intermittent energy restriction. Um, and to define that, essentially what it means is, is you're alternating periods um, of energy restriction or dieting um, alternated with periods of higher energy intake. Um, and usually those periods of higher energy intake, you're usually eating – um, enough to maintain your body weight or actually even um, a little bit above your weight maintenance energy requirements. Um, but the tricky thing with, with sort of intermittent dieting is, is there's so, so many different sort of dietary protocols that fit within that heading of intermittent dieting. Um, like we have intermittent fasting, alternate day fasting, five through diet, refeeds, diet breaks. Um, they, they all sort of fit within this umbrella term of intermittent dieting, even though there's so much variation between how long a person diets for before they get a refeed or before they increase their energy intake or how long the, the higher feeding period lasts for. So it causes a little bit of like there's a lot of review papers out there that are sort of comparing intermittent versus continuous dieting. Um, I tend to have a little bit of a problem with them because they're collating all these different dietary protocols in the intermittent group, even though there's such variation um, right. in, in the actual protocol itself. Like in, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's not smart to group together um, a 5-2 diet. So just quickly, a 5-2 diet is where you um, eat either nothing or maybe 10% of your energy requirements on two days of the two days of the week, and then the other five days of the week, you just eat whatever you want. I, I, I can't see how that, that sort of method of dieting could, could fit within the same grouping as sort of a, a, a two-day refeed at the end of the week sort of thing, which is what lots of athletes are following at the moment. So um, there is a fair bit of data that shows there's probably, in, in terms of these reviews, there's that says there's not a whole lot of difference between intermittent and continuous dieting, but I think that these reviews are significantly limited um, – in their conclusions just because there, there's there's so much variety in the protocols and, and I don't think all intermittent diet protocols work the same. I think there's definitely some that are better than others. Right. So that kind of leads me right into the next thing. Is there a certain protocol or a certain method that you think is better than others and has a little bit more research behind it that might work a little bit better than just what's been all collated together as intermittently dieting with refeeds and throwing it all together there? I gave you a softball there. Um, yeah, you did. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the, the sort of the two best um, intermittent sort of protocols that we can talk about that I think is, is going to be either sort of the refeed method or the diet break method. Um, now, there's still a little bit of variation between the refeed method and the diet break method, but essentially what a refeed means is your higher feeding period or your increase in energy intake lasts for 24 to 48 hours. Um, on the other hand, a diet break is you're increasing food, but usually it's sort of minimum three days up to a week, up to two weeks even. Um, now, in, in terms of I'll sort of, I'll sort of go to, into the data a bit here because it probably will help to give the people a little bit more of a better idea. Um, there's sort of five, five studies um, 
that I think are really really good. Um, there's two on the refeed refeed method. Um, now I'll start with um, Bill Campbell's research, who's over in um, University of Tampa, or F- Florida, I think. I think it's um, South Florida, yeah. Yeah, South Florida. That's the one. Um, now he's just he's this hasn't been published. It's only been presented as a conf- um, conference abstract. But what he what he did is. Um, he took a group of resistance trained athletes um, and he separated them into two groups and one group was a continuous group. So they just dieted every day for seven, for seven weeks. Mm-hmm. Now the other group, um, they dieted for seven weeks as well and they had the, they matched the calorie deficit between both groups on a weekly basis. So they were eating the same amount of calories per week, each group, but after five days of dieting, they had a 48 hour re- refeed at the end of the week. And what, what we saw is after seven weeks, um, the intermittent group or the refeed group, they actually maintained their metabolic rate higher than the continuous group. Um, and they also retained more muscle mass um, or lean mass than, than the continuous group. Now, if you can, if you can maintain your, your metabolism or your resting energy expenditure at higher levels, that's going to make fat loss and weight loss a whole lot more efficient. And that's this term that we call fat loss effic- efficiency, which is the amount of fat that you can lose um, per unit of energy restri- restriction. So, so essentially that means they're losing more weight per every calorie that they're in the deficit for. Um, we also have a study um, on rats. Now, people tend to be like, oh, fuck, it's just a rat study, like, go away. But p- people need to understand that, that, that um, rat studies in terms of nutrition can be pretty, pretty effective um, because we know exactly what the hell the rats are eating. And when we're working with humans, we can tell them to eat something, but it doesn't necessarily mean they'll freaking do it. Um, and sometimes they don't do it. But they tell you they're doing it, which makes mm-hmm. it even worse because you're like, okay, they said they're eating these targets, but they're having like cheat day every day, like when they by themselves. So, so I like I tend to not bloody um, just knock rat studies straight off. Um, like mm-hmm. we know that the physiological profiles of rats and humans are a little bit different. Um, but in this study, what they did is they they again, um, it was a I believe it was a six or seven week diet. One group of the rats was just dieting every day for the entire time. Um, the other group, um, they dieted for five days on the same deficit as a continuous group, and then they just eat the rats, uh, let the let the rats eat whatever they wanted um, for two days. So what happened at the end of the of the diet was even though the intermittent group was eating a lot more than the continuous group because they were just allowed to eat whatever they wanted two days mm-hmm. a week, um, even though they were eating so much more, um, they actually lost just as much weight and fat as a continuous group, which again comes back to that uh, weight loss efficiency thing, which means that they're, they're, they're losing more weight per unit of energy restriction. Um, so so that, that's sort of a data that, data that suggests that 24, 48-hour refeeds um, could be effective, um, but it's, it's, it's far from conclusive data. Like honestly, um, b- before, Bill's, before um, Bill's data, like we were honestly guessing and just relying on a fair bit of theoretical rationale and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that leads me on to, to the diet break method, which I probably think is going to be a little bit better um, than the refeed method. Um, and, and essentially what the diet break is, is this, this longer term period of, of, of um, higher feeding. Um, now, my supervisor, um, she was heading this big study that was called the Matador study. Um, and this was sort of the, the, the big study that sort of was like, okay, diet breaks, they probably, there's probably something we need to look at here. Um, they probably got a fair bit of benefit um, for dieting people. Now, now they use overweight people. So, again, we're, we're a little bit limited in what sort of conclusions we can draw from that data. But what they did is they took one group and they dieted them for 16 weeks straight. They were just dieted like a standard um, standard weight loss phase. Mm-hmm. The other group, they did 16 weeks of dieting as well, but after every two weeks of dieting, they gave the per- people a two-week diet break where they were eating a, a, enough to, to just maintain their body weight. So the intervention for the intermittent group was longer because they had all these diet breaks, but they still did the same amount of dieting of like dieting weeks per se. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we saw was at the end of the sort of both – after 16 dieting weeks in both groups, um, the intermittent group – lost more weight, more fat, um, and they better maintain the metabol- their resting energy expenditure than the continuous group, which, which just trickled down in the entire, um, the entire weight loss phase, whereas the intermittent sort of had these little jumps and they maintained a little bit better. Um, we also saw that when they were followed up six months later, um, the intermittent group had regained less weight than the continuous group. The continuous group put a whole lot of weight back on. And again, that tells us, okay, probably 
Um, the continuous group, they're suppressing their resting energy expenditure or their, their total daily energy expenditure to a, to a far greater degree than, than the diet break group. Um, I know we get, I know we're going a little bit hard on the research here, but I'll just go. I'll finish no, that's one more, fine. I'll finish one more study. Um, uh, so, so I said a diet break is sort of minimum three days of high feeding. Mm-hmm. Um, so that they, they, another study, they, they took a, a six week diet, one group again, the continuous traditional diet, dieting every day. Um, the other group after, after every 11 days of dieting, they gave them a three day diet break. Um, and what they saw is after the six weeks, again, resting energy expenditure was maintained at a higher rate um, than the continuous group. And even though they were eating more, they lost just as much um, body fat and body weight as a continuous group. So, so there's, a little, there's a little bit of research that suggests that maybe, just maybe, um, an intermittent diet approach could be better than a continuous approach. And, and it, the likely reason that this is happening is because um, when you're giving your, your – giving the system a sort of a temporary boost in, in energy intake um, or food intake, it's potentially reversing some of the negative um, adaptations that happen as a consequence of dieting. Um, and some of those adaptations include decreases in, in energy expenditure, um, alterations in metabolic, um, so alterations in endocrine hormone profiles um, that make you hungrier. They also make it harder to lose fat. Um, mm-hmm. And they also have um, regular, regulatory roles on energy expenditure as well. Um, and, and just as a, another another potential benefit of sort of an intermittent diet is this is this um, this impact on psychology. Um, now we know that like, like I, I'm I'm pulling this because I'm working with with guys in the diet break group at the moment, and they're coming to me and they're telling me like, dude, like I feel fucking great. Like after these diet breaks, like yeah. I, I'm ready to I'm ready to tackle this these next this next block of dieting. Um, so that that's real world like feedback that I'm getting um, in that study. So I'm I'm thinking that um, because the athlete or the person doesn't feel so restricted over such a long period of time that an intermittent diet may be beneficial just because they give themselves a little bit of a, a mental break, um, from that sort of that constant deficit. So, um, and, and if they feel sort of, uh, mentally stronger, mentally better, it's likely that they're going to be able to stick to the diet um, in the long term. And we know that the biggest predictor of success on any weight loss diet is adherence to the program. So if they are better able to, to adhere to the program, that's a massive that's a massive thing that nutritionists need to be thinking about because they, they need to be like, okay, well, it doesn't really matter how optimal a diet is. If they can't stick to it, it's not going to work. So if we can make it more likely that, that the athletes are going to stick to this program, we probably need to be start swinging things towards this diet break method. Um, it could be a a bit better yeah right so it, it's much more than just the play like there are probably some potential beneficial physiological benefits of reversing some of those adaptations but oh, absolutely, that, yeah. that psychological side probably plays a pretty large role too with adherence and everything too mm, massive yep so from from where we're at right now it does it kind of seem like a longer diet break of maybe you know four to seven days a week long does that seem a little bit more powerful than just a refeed or does that seem like a little bit better of a protocol or maybe even using these protocols together? Has anybody looked at refeeds along with diet breaks or what What would you kind of say comparing refeeds and diet breaks there? Mm-hmm. Um, so no one's looked at refeeds and diet breaks sort of simultaneously. Like we, on, we honestly have a handful of, of papers on one or the other. Right. Um, but in terms of sort of, why why I think a diet break might be better. Um, now, refeeds got popular um, when some data came out a few years ago which showed when you give a person, when you're dieting down a person and you give them a big boost in carbohydrate, you get this surge in leptin. And we know leptin is one of the hormones that regulates our appetite and our energy expenditure. So when you have higher leptin levels, you're more satiated, you're less hungry, um, and you have a higher energy expenditure. So this, this led some people to speculate that, okay, well, if we're dieting down a person and we give them a 24, 48-hour increase in carbohydrate, we're going to boost leptin right up. Um, the person's going to be less hungry. Um, they're going to get this metabolic kickstart, um, and they're going to be able to diet more effectively for the, for the days leading on. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but the problem with this, like that is absolutely true. Like that, you give someone carbohydrates, that, that will boost le- leptin. But 
the problem is like how much is that boosting leptin translating to improved um, body composition outcomes? Now, now what we saw with with that data is is when you map out the sort of the the increase in leptin um, from a 24 48 hour refeed, it only translates to sort of a seven percent increase in in energy expenditure. So it's not a massive amount. Like that's not right. that's not going to translate to a massive like drastic increase in fat loss. It's just not mm. going to happen. Um, so I think people are sort of overstating the the benefits of refeeds a little bit better. A little bit like it's definitely going to still have a psychological benefit it's like okay i i worked hard this monday to friday like now we get to sort of right. let the ha- hair down a little bit and have some more carbs and things like that um but i it's like i've looked pretty hard at the research and i think that um when you've been dieting and when you're of a fairly lean body composition um the adaptations that are happening in response to that diet are very persistent and they're not easily counteracted like you can't just give someone an extra hundred grams of carbohydrate and expect all this reversal of negative adaptations it's right. just not going to happen um so that's why i think a, a diet break might be more effective um because you're putting this person into energy balance for sort of three days to, to even two weeks which which was with the matters or study mm-hmm. and it looks like that that's probably a long enough time for the body to be like okay um we're not so deprived um we've got a fair bit of energy around um there's energy availability is okay we can start turning back the clock on some of these negative adaptations we can start reversing some of the hormonal down regulation some of the energy expenditure down regulation because because food's available we're not we're not right. we're not like we're not starving if we want to sort of go back to that evolutionary um principle um so yeah like in, in summary like the, the negative adaptations that happen with dieting, like they, they're, they're quite significant. Like you can't, you mm-hmm. can't just expect, you can't just expect that they're going to be turned back um, with such a short term, um, short term refeed. Uh, and in my research group at the moment, we're just about to publish a paper. Uh, and what it's looked at is, it's it's looked at all the studies, so it's a systematic review collecting all the all the reviews on the topic. And it's looking at when you take a person into energy balance after a diet. So energy balance means you're just eating enough to maintain your body weight. So not a surplus, not a deficit, just right. um, enough to maintain your body weight. Um, and it looked at all the data that's taken people into a, to energy balance after a diet. And, and then it's looked at what happens to, to some of the sort of the negative adaptations of dieting. Um, and what we know is is – after short terms in energy balance, um, the person is still like we don't get reversal of of appetite to a larger degree. Um, we get only partial normalization of resting energy expenditure. It doesn't come to come back to normal very quickly, mm-hmm. um, but we do get um, in some cases um, normalization of leptin. So, one one of the sort of misconceptions about um, refeeds and diet breaks is is that. You're going to have these carbs or have this more food. Um, you're just going to feel so satisfied and, like, you're not going to be hungry anymore. But the literature sort of looks like you're still going to be pretty damn hungry um, and it takes a longer period of time um, before the body is like, okay, there's enough food around. We can start downregulating hunger a little bit. Um, so that was a little bit of a long-winded answer. But essentially um, what I'm trying to say is, is the adaptations that, that occur with reducing body fat um, – that yeah, they, they they probably need at least three to sort of seven days in energy balance or above to sort of get at least partial normalization, if not complete normalization. Right. So basically, a refeed is just a little bit too short in duration to be able to actually reverse some of those more physiological adaptations that occur. Mm-hmm. Then, yeah, like I, I think so. I think so. Like I think a diet break is better. But we still have that data coming out of, of Bill Campbell's lab, which used the 48-hour yeah. refeed, and they saw a little bit of better body composition outcomes. So it might have a it might have a little benefit, but I still think diet breaks are better. Right. Okay. I think that makes a lot of sense. And kind of the next place I'd like to move to is like, so say say an athlete wants to do a more intermittent style diet. What considerations would you say? Or what, what things should they consider when setting up this diet? And this could be things like how frequently they might place a diet break or what they might do with their training. I know this could be a, this could be a long answer potentially, but what, what would be some considerations on that? Okay. Um, so, so essentially with, with my study, um, so when, when we're planning this with – so I, I did most of my planning with Eric Helms on this. And, and what, we, what we sat down and we said, okay, let's try and think about what would be close to the most optimal intermittent diet approach that an athlete could follow. 
Um, now we know we had the data on the, the two week on two week off, so two week diet, two week diet break method. Um, but what we were sort of talking about is like that that doubles the length of the intervention. So instead of dieting for sixteen weeks, like they're not dieting for any longer, but essentially you're still tracking and monitoring intake fairly heavily. Right. And it's not like the diet breaks like a like go eat whatever the hell you want. It's like, still enjoy, restricted. Enjoy yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Like you're still going to be damn hungry. Like um, so it, it it doubled the length of the intervention. So so what mm. we were saying is. Could we still get benefit by, by making the, these diet breaks um, not as long um, and not and 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 more um, not as frequent? So it didn't it didn't lengthen the dieting phase as long. So what we did instead of a two week on two week off, we've done three week diet with one week diet break. So three weeks dieting, one week mm-hmm. diet, and then and did, and then just alternate that. Um, now I don't we don't know yet if that's better um, than the two week on two week off. Um, but if we can still see um, benefits in terms of fat loss efficiency and normalization of sort of some of that adaptive responses to dieting, then athletes will absolutely prefer that method because they're not in the they're not in an intervention for as long. Right. Um, so that that's one consideration we have is is like how how like how little diet breaks can we get away with where we still get a a, a, be, a more improvement in in sort of weight loss outcomes and a continuous approach. Um, so that's one of the considerations. Um, Another one is is sort of what should you eat during your diet break. Um, now, what we know is that leptin is particularly sensitive to carbohydrate intake. Um, we know that when you overfeed someone on fat, leptin doesn't really uh, do much. Mm-hmm. Um, now, we think that because we see in some of the research leptin becomes normalized after sort of higher feeding, we think that if – you eat a, a, a fair bit amount of carbohydrates on your diet break weeks, you might get a bit of potential normalization of, of leptin, and this is going to therefore have positive implications on, on resting energy expenditure and potentially satiety, but we're not 100% sure on that. Um, if it was the case, um, the person in, in the sort of the diet weeks following that, they'd be able to lose fat more efficiently. Um, and they'd be less hungry, which might lead to less compensatory overeating um, during during the dieting weeks. Um, so it seems likely that um, in a diet break, you should be allocating a fair chunk of your sort of those extra calories that you get maybe adding on. Um, you should be allocating a fair decent amount to towards carbohydrate. Um, in terms of my study, we actually don't increase fat at all. So what okay. we do is we, we have their, their baseline dieting calories and then when they go into their diet break, we take up their calories um, to how much they need to st- maintain their weight. So it's a fair de- – it's like that, that usually it's around 400, 500 calorie bump. Is that adjusted to their new maintenance? Or- correct, correct. Okay. So it's, it's accounted for changes in body weight over – Okay. From the post three weeks, yeah. So it, it is it is adjusted. Um, each diet break's adjusted each time. Um, so what we do, we take the calories up. Now that increase in calories, so it's four, say it's four hundred. Mm-hmm. Um, we allocate that all towards carbohydrate. So in that case, that would be a hundred gram increase yeah. in carbohydrate. We leave protein and we leave fat the same because it doesn't seem likely that increasing protein or fat during diet break is going to have any meaningful impact on sort of. Right. And, and any meaningful um, weight loss outcomes. So, so we're, we're giving them, we're giving them the carbs during the diet break, and I think that's probably a wise decision as an athlete. Another reason is is when someone's carbohydrate restricted, we know that they get depletion of intramuscular glycogen. Now, when intramuscular glycogen is low or, or depleted, um, you will see a performance decrement. You will on strength and endurance, like both. Like people mm-hmm. seem to think like that athletes can get away with a fucking like low carb diet and just like, yeah, ketones, like, no, like it does not happen. Like there is so much data from the last literally 30 years on like Olympic athletes, sport athletes that show like if you give a, a, an athlete less carbs, they will perform worse. So following on from that, it makes sense that if you give a more, if you give an athlete more carbs, they'll perform better because when, when you get more saturated glycogen, you're able to maintain better strength and endurance output. So it's, we think that 
um, having the car- carbohydrate diet breaks is going to lead to improved performance at least during those diet break weeks because you're going to be able to tolerate a higher training volume um, and you're going to be able to maintain higher output just purely from having more saturated glycogen stores. And this, like, we're not 100% sure, but that could potentially lead into sort of better performance even in the dieting weeks. We're just not sure how sort of the saturation in glycogen lasts for. Um, so that's another consideration. Like, if you, get, if you, if you went on a diet break – and you just gave an athlete a ton of fat, like that ain't gonna, that's not going to do shit for glycogen. It's not going to do shit for performance either. So, yeah, I think, I think it's very smart for an athlete to be, to be loading up, um, like not overfeeding, but at least like with that, with that calorie increase, you should be, a, a majority of it should be coming from carbohydrate, if not all of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. So kind of the two main considerations there are maybe every, would you say every three or so weeks thrown in a diet break? And that would probably be for your new maintenance. So maybe relative to the body weight lost. And then you would also, when you add calories, do it kind of favor it in carbohydrate. Does that sound about right? Absolutely. Yep. Cool. And then do you think that, your body fat percentage of where you start your diet plays into this too. So like, do you think if somebody starts at a higher body fat percentage, say around, I don't know, upper teens around 20%, do you think that they would need less frequent diet breaks as they go? Or do you think that it would still, since they're still spending time in a deficit, they still might need these diet breaks every three or so weeks, somewhere in there. That is a very good question. And so the way I'll answer it is I think that um, a leaner athlete or a leaner person um, deserves more frequent um, and longer duration diet breaks. And the reason for that is, is when you're of a very lean body composition, um, the negative adaptations of dieting tend to be a whole lot more severe. Um, some examples include um, a lean athlete um, will lose a lot more percentage of their weight from fat-free mass or muscle than an athlete at a higher body fat. That's typically why um, there's a massive limitation of, of overweight nutritional research because when you take someone and you start dieting them when they're, they're obese to start with, typically we don't see any decreases in fat-free mass because we know that adipose or fat has such a protective effect on, on muscle loss. Um, so we know we sometimes like it, research has shown that a lean athlete versus an overweight athlete, they can have two to three times greater um, protein losses that, than, than the overweight athlete. Um, we know that they're more susceptible to fat free mass loss. Um, w- another thing that we also see is when comparing, um, lean, lean athletes dieting and overweight people dieting, um, the lean person tends to see pretty severe decreases in testosterone levels. Now we know that testosterone is sort of our key anabolic hormone that plays a role in maintaining muscle mass. Um, and, but what we see is with, with this overweight weight research, testosterone doesn't go down. Sometimes it even increases. So like it, it, what that tells us is, is that a person that's quite lean, um, their, their body's fighting back a lot harder. And they're starting to put up some of these these roadblocks to be like, okay, we don't want to lose much more weight, so we're going to be um, a little bit more aggressive with the pullback that we have against you because we don't, yeah, we don't want you to lose any more weight. So, so with those considerations, it, it makes sense that, like, I'm guessing here, like, this is sort of yeah. just, uh, we we don't have research on it yet, but right. it, ma- it would it would make sense that someone who is lean. Um, should probably be in implementing um, more frequent and longer diet breaks, um, and it also suggests that they're probably going to get more benefit from them. Now, if if you are if you are giving an overweight person a whole lot of diet breaks, yeah, they'll get the psychological benefit, but because the system isn't fighting back as hard, they're probably not going to get some of the, most of the physiological benefits yet because the system isn't sort of out of homeostasis right. yet. If that makes sense, yeah. So that's that's my opinion on it. But yeah, I'm not I'm not totally sure. Yeah. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I think that if somebody is, you know, a little bit more overweight and they want to use diet breaks and don't have any sort of like time constraints on when they want to end the diet or anything like that, then I see why not, you know? So I think that it could only potentially have benefits. And, you know, there's, there's another opinion floating around that when you get to a certain level of leanness, you don't, even even diet breaking at that certain level of leanness, you're just extending the amount of time that you're kind of 
spending in that kind of that suck zone of like below, I don't know, 10 or 8% body fat. So the idea is that it's almost like you're about to go underwater and you just want to come up, take a breath, and maybe you diet break right when you're right around 10%. And then you just dive down to either get to your show or your photo shoot or something like that. And you just kind of don't worry about diet breaks because that might just expand the amount of time that you're kind of in that in that zone where things could get you know, pretty hairy. Do you have any, I know there's not going to be any like research on these super lean athletes doing diet breaks, not diet breaks, but would you speculate, speculate at all on what, what you might think here? Mm, Yeah. See, I I don't know. Um, but I probably tend to disagree with that a little bit. Like I don't, I don't think that it makes too much sense that like once you get below a certain body fat, then it's just pushed to the finish. I don't really mm-hmm. understand. Like, like yeah, you get the benefit of a shorter um, diet phase, but if it's less efficient, then I don't think that's a worthwhile trade-off. Um, like just anecdotally here, like from speaking with Eric and his team 3DMJ, mm-hmm. um, they tend to sort of, favor longer bigger diet breaks as a as a bodybuilder gets closer to contests so they're trying to actually increase food um in those final stages and they're they're seeing a lot of um a lot of benefit with that method so there's nothing i'm aware of that that would suggest that sort of once you get below eight percent just hang in there and go for the finish I'm, i'm not aware of any sort of research whether observational or mm-hmm. um or scientific trials that suggested that would, that would be better than than not not diet breaking during that time right and you know that that probably makes the most sense to me too and when i think about it like a lot of bodybuilders will, t- will talk about how how much better they feel when they're eating into a show so like mm. if you took a diet break and ate a little bit more food and just felt better i feel like that would still be beneficial and even if you are already that lean Absolutely. Mm, yep. So the the kind of the the last kind of like little consideration I'd like to talk about is training. So when an athlete is dieting and they take this diet break, what do you think that they they might potentially do with their training here? You know, I know some people like to deload, some people just train through it. What do you think here? Mm, that's a good question. Um, there's a couple of ways we can attack this. Um, now, just talking about the, the refeed method, sort of the 24 to 48 hour feeding, there is um, speculation by some coaches that on the days that you are refeeding, um, you should train your weak body part or the body part that you're most hoping to, to, to grow. Um, now, the rationale behind that is that um, when you have a big increase in, in carbohydrate on those days, you get a more amplified anabolic response. Um, and it, this happens through insulin. So we know that when you get a whole lot of insulin um, in the system, the activation of, of this AKT mTOR pathway. Now, this pathway is, is a pathway that leads to, to sort of stimulating muscle protein synthesis. We also know that insulin blocks protein degradation. So in theory, it would make sense that um, – Say you wanted to grow your chest, you're going to refeed on Saturday, so you're going to train chest on Saturday. It makes sense that um, these carbs are going to stimulate protein synthesis on that day more so than um, on a day where you were carbohydrate depleted, um, and this potentially could lead to to sort of more muscle growth in that area. I think that's stretching big time. Um, like, yeah, like I. I like we don't have any evidence to suggest that that's probably like going to make meaningful impacts on increased muscle growth. Like, mm-hmm. like, like I said, because it's only 24 to four hours or maybe 48 hours, like I don't think that's enough, um, enough of, of an increase in, in, in food to sort of merit sort of drastic changes in muscle growth. Like I don't think it's going to happen. And, and I think that if you just put your refeed on any day in training muscle group, I don't think you'd notice any any difference if we sort of track that. Right. Um, now, now with the diet break, it's a little bit different. Um, I think you can do some training things. So, so with the refeed, I don't think it really matters. Um, mm-hmm. I know some people would like to like like to do on their weak body parts, and maybe it gives them a little like a psychological benefit because they're like, oh yeah, I feel full and good, and I can train hard on that muscle. But um, I don't think it's gonna. I don't think it's really gonna affect the the outcomes at the end of the day. Okay. Um, but with a diet break, I, I think there is some things you can do. Um, now, I've spoken with Eric and Andy Galpin about this, and now, now if you're doing a diet break that's that's sort of a week long. Um, you're essentially providing the athlete with with 
additional nutritional support um, that's going to negate some of the, the negatives of, of continuous dieting um, that's happened in the weeks previous. Now, because this is happening, um, the athlete is – if it's, if it's for a week long of higher food, the athlete's going to be able to tolerate higher volumes and they're going to be able to perform better. So it makes sense that, that in diet breaks, you might want to have higher volume training blocks um, or either outcome-focused training sessions. Now, what outcome-focused training sessions is, is this is sort of going back to a little bit more sports athletes and, and not so much bodybuilders. Okay. Um, but if you had a sports athlete and you wanted to have a testing week, that comes up where you want to you want to track progress. It mm-hmm. makes sense that you would potentially um, do the allocate those testing weeks on the days of the of the diet break weeks um, because it's going to give you a, like because in the weeks before you're going to have a lot of accumulated fatigue. Now mm-hmm. in the diet break we see the fatigue go down and fitness go up. So right. potentially that it's going to give us a more true representation of, of how the athletes tracking how they're progressing and how they're performing. Um, now with the bodybuilders. Um, I don't think you should. I don't think you really need to deload. Like I think the, I think just deload as normally um, as whatever your whatever your mesocycle dictates. Um, but even I, I might even think that if, if you're pushing, it depends how you how you're tr- structuring your training cycle. But if you're pushing sure. pretty high to your, your maximal rec- recoverable volume, it, I don't know if you guys have talked about that. Yeah. Mike has talked yeah. talks about it. My like, audience yeah. should be familiar with that. Okay. Dope. Um, if you're pushing up to close your MRV for like a week or something like that before leading up to a deload, maybe the week after, mm-hmm. I think you could potentially get some benefits by diet breaking the week before a deload. So you're, yeah. you're, you're going to be able to tolerate a whole lot more work during that week where you sort of you're working at sort of pretty close to your maximum capacity. Um, you're probably going to have a have a really good training week with the additional nutritional support, and then the week after you go back into the, your deficit, and maybe you can deload at that point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I think I think it makes sense to sort of either do more work during diet breaks or or allocate your testing weeks um, during diet break weeks as well if you're a sports athlete. Yeah, I I think that makes a lot of sense too, and I think it probably also depends on like what exactly your deload looks like too. Like, oh yeah, if say someone like has a pretty drastic reduction in their, in their training volume, like say, say they just cut it in half throughout their entire deload week. Would you still recommend being in a calorie deficit in that scenario? Or do you think that that could potentially risk a little bit of muscle loss if they cut their training volume by that much? Or what do you kind of think about that? So, so with deloads, um, Yes, I like to sort of do a 30 to 50% cut in volume, mm-hmm. um, but I tend to not like to compromise intensity. So, okay. so if you did four sets of bench, um, 10 reps of 100 kilos, um, you wouldn't go then the next week for your deload and do two sets um, of 100 kilos but only five reps because that's bringing down the intensity a, a, a lot more. Mm-hmm. So what I, what I would do is, is instead of doing the four, four by 10 of 100, you do two by ten of a hundred, and when you're doing that, I, I tend to not see any muscle loss. Now, even yeah. when working, when you're working with sports athletes, um, to, to give you a different perspective, let's say we have a um, a football team. Um, when when they, they deload as well, um, and I'm not talking about weight training, I'm talking about like track time. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when you deload sports athletes, um, you don't tell them to go and and run slower, but we're going to also do less training duration. It doesn't happen. <laughs> yes, the train the training duration comes down, but it's go 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 like maintain intensity right. as you did the last week. The decrease that's still a decrease in volume, which is going to allow fatigue to come down, and fitness to come up. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I, like going back to your question, I don't think like if if you're if you're cutting volume in fifty percent. But you're leaving intensity where it is. Um, I don't think you're going to risk muscle loss, so I think it's going to be fine to to sort of push with the deficit in that time. But I'm not 100 percent sure. That's sort of me sort of speculating a bit. Yeah, I I think that makes sense, and I I'm not sure where I've heard it. If it was something I read or something like that, but I for some reason I was thinking that when you keep your intensity higher or your intensity a little bit higher, you can get away, quote unquote, get away with a little bit less volume and still maintain muscle mass. I don't know where I heard that, but I I think, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that big time. Okay, cool. So as for training during a, a diet break period, it might be a good idea to either ramp volume up and to maybe do a little testing week right before deload. But 
Then again, if your diet break some, somehow lands on your deload, probably a good idea to make sure to keep your intensity higher if you're reducing volume. Does that sound a pretty good recap there? 100%. Yep. Cool. All right. So the, the kind of last thing that I want to talk about here is how you might handle the, the post diet period. So they're all done with their cut. They got to their goal body weight. How might you handle after this period? And I think it, it might make quite a bit sense to discuss maybe, maybe what you would do for a shorter cut. So maybe for a four to six week cut, and then maybe a mid range cut of eight to 12 or so, and then maybe a longer cut. So how you would handle that post diet phase. Mm. Mm. So essentially what the, the two sort of strategies that we can go with is either a reverse diet or, or what's called the recovery diet. Mm-hmm. Now a reverse diet, essentially what that means is you finish the diet phase and then sort of the, the post diet eight to sometimes even 16 weeks, you're just slowly trickle calories up and that trickles calories up through the deficit. So essentially for the first sort of month, you're not actually back into weight maintenance or energy balance. You're just reducing the size of the energy deficit. Right. Um, I don't think that's a good approach. Um, and I don't think it matters really how long you've been dieting for, whether it's short or long term. I don't think that's a good approach because um, what we know is to reverse some of the negative adaptations um, of dieting, we need the person to be at least in energy balance. Now, if they're still in an energy deficit, even if it's less, that's not going to reverse any of the negative adaptations um, of dieting. So I don't think that's a good approach. Yeah. Um, what I think is a better approach is – is and, and to be honest, I don't actually think it depends too on the much length of on, diet. On, on, on the length of the diet. Okay. Like, like if you're doing a mini cut, like it's pretty standard for – like a mini cut my last six weeks or something. Mm-hmm. It will be pretty, pretty standard for someone to even just go back to what they were eating pre-mini cut without yeah. like not, not having an in-between phase. Um, but with, with sort of a, at least a standard cut or, or a long-term cut, um, I think a, a, a smart way to go about it is probably to, to increase the weight maintenance immediately. So essentially what that would, what would that would be is um, the same way that we do it in our study where we, we sort of the estimated um, energy requirements weight maintenance, increase the calories straight off the bat. It probably still seems well. I'd still give it to carbohydrate. I wouldn't be increasing the other other nutrients mm-hmm. unless unless fat is so low that the that, that, that there's palatability issues with the diet and things like that. I'd, I'd still be giving a, a decent chunk um, of carbohydrates. I'd probably run there with a week, and from that point, so like once you're at weight maintenance, we know that you're going to start getting reversal of some of the the, the energy expenditure suppression, some of the um, alterations in hormone profiles and things like that. Once mm-hmm. you get to that point, then you can be more conservative with with um, with the increases in, in energy intake. But people need to understand that sort of once you go back to energy balance. You're not going to immediately feel 100%. Um, you're not going to feel like satiated on, on on weight maintenance, calorie level. It's not going to happen. So right. it's still it's still going to feel like a, a more mild case of restriction. So it still takes like yeah, it, it it's still going to be a little bit draining, um, but it's going to be a lot less draining than if you reverse diet and just trickled calories up so slowly. But yeah, so bring them up to energy balance immediately um, post diet. Um, and then you can be make pretty moderate sort of calorie jumps every sort of one to two weeks until the person sort of five to, to 10% above, um, above the, 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 the weight that they finish their diet phase at. Now this, mm-hmm. this is sort of where it comes a little bit difference between bodybuilders versus sort of other athletes in general pop. Like, if like like for example an athlete might only have to lose five percent of their body weight during a diet phase so it wouldn't make sense to then like take them to five to ten percent of their post diet weight straight after if that makes sense but but bodybuilders tend to like bodybuilders are losing 15 percent of their body weight 20 percent of their body weight like they're Mm -hmm. losing a, a whole lot so um and we know that because they get sort of stage lean we know that the um the negative adaptations are so severe at that point that um, you've got to be a little bit more aggressive with the calorie increases so you can get them back to feeling normal and being able to train and whatnot. Right. Um, but with a, with a sports athlete, you can probably like it sort of, I'd still bring them up to weight maintenance immediately. Um, but th- you'd be a little bit more conservative with, with how much you increase their food. Um, right. Then, then if you would be um, with a bodybuilder, uh, but even with the bodybuilding scenario, once, once they're at five to 10% um, above their stage weight um, with the sort of 
as long as they got like stage lean, like really mm-hmm. freaking lean, right. um, then then you can pull things back and be a little bit more conservative with how much you're sort of right. increasing calories and sort of just make sure it's in line with your targeted rate of weight gain for for mm-hmm. an off season. Yeah, kind of kind of go into a more normal rate of weight gain Correct. throughout the off yeah. season. Cool. Yeah, and then yeah. for a more general pop person, since since they're not getting like stage lean, they probably don't need that five to 10% increase in weight. Do you kind of just go a maintenance phase and then kind of see how they're feeling and go, go based off that? Or would you just do like one mesocycle or something at maintenance? Or how would you kind of figure out the time course to stay kind of around maintenance for them? Yeah. Well, you gotta like, you gotta understand when, when we're working with gen pop people, like their, their priority is to maintain the lost weight. So right. you're not, it's not like you're turning into an off season and being like, okay, now we want to mm-hmm. gain 300 yeah. grams a week. As well as, so you have to take a little bit of a different approach. Like you will take them up to weight maintenance. Um, but essentially what, what your goal as a nutritionist is at that point is to sort of get them at a caloric level where they're eating, where they feel like they're not restricted and they can sort of make, they can sort of stay within 5% of their, of their post weight, mm-hmm. their post diet body weight. So it's a little, little yeah. bit of a different approach with those sort of goals. Yeah. And then for, say it's just a kind of a recreational bodybuilder that didn't quite get like stage lean. Maybe they just did kind of a, a standard cut and now they want to kind of go through a gaining phase and gain some muscle. Would you say that they could take just maybe a short little maintenance phase for a few weeks and then kind of slowly work back into that kind of that typical rate of weight gain throughout an off season or? Mm, yeah so so same approach but less aggressive than the bodybuilder who got to six percent okay yeah yep i I think that makes a lot of sense and you know Mm. i think that's about it for what we needed to cover today is there any like future research that you're like doing right now and that you're really excited about kind of on this topic or what what's to come here um some cool shit that's going to happen is is um we've got a review paper that's just been finished um we're submitting that for, for um, peer review this week. Um, and the authors on that, we've got Helms, um, Lane Norton, Andy Galpin. And, and what, we've do, what we've done is we've collected sort of all the, the data that exists on intermittent versus continuous dieting. We've, we've looked at it all and we've said, right, okay, looking at what we have, what sort of implications does this research have for athletes that are potentially considering how, how to do an intermittent diet? Um, and what we do is we also put a lot of practical recommendations in there. So what we say is like, okay, if an athlete is going to use refeeds or diet breaks, this is like, we don't know for sure, but this is probably a pretty decent way to do it. And this is, so we get, we get a lot of recommendations. Mm-hmm. So I'm really excited about getting this paper published because it's such a great resource. Um, it's going to be like, it's going to be like a book really. Like it's going to like people, people are going to learn a lot from it. And, and the problem with this intermittent dieting is where where it currently sits is, is refeeds and diet breaks. They're being prescribed by nutritionists purely based on anecdote. Um, and and being like, okay, this is what my coach told me to do, blah, blah, blah. Like Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very, very speculative. And I think this is going to be the first paper that's sort of been like, okay, like, Let's stop speculating so much and let's, let's sort of look at what the research actually says about right. these things. So that's one thing that I'm pretty excited about. Um, obviously, I've got the massive um, diet break paper that we're working on at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also want to look at um, – we're collecting the data at the moment. I'm just not sure exactly how we're going to set it up. But essentially what we're going to be comparing is um, – the psychological differences between an intermittent versus continuous diet. And we're looking at things like body image perception, body dysmorphia, um, the drive to eat, things like that. We, cause we, we speculate that, um, an intermittent diet is going to be better than a con- continuous diet for things like that. Yeah. Uh, but we don't, that hasn't been tested yet. So I'm, I'm collecting that data on the side. I just haven't decided what I'm going to, what I'm going to do with that yet. Um, and post, post this research, I'm very keen to sort of, to tackle the so what we just talked about the the reverse versus recovery diet mm. um, which hasn't been tested um, before uh, we just think that the recovery diet's probably a fair bit better. Yeah, uh, uh, like I was just gonna say, these things haven't been tested a lot, and I can't wait, especially on the the psychology part of it. Like a lot of people just kind of say anecdotally, diet breaks, refeeds are great for like your psychological health, but it would be really interesting to see like some more objective body dysmorphia, body image and things like that. See if that's improved with that stuff for sure. Yeah, man, for sure. Awesome. Well, where, where can people find more about your stuff? Where can people find you? 
Um, best place to find me is just Instagram at Jackson Pios. Um, I put all my research updates on there, and, um, and some of some of the new research that comes out in the field, I sort of summarise it and do a little um, pull some Chinese take takeaways for mm -hmm. for the posts and things like that. Because I know I know people aren't going to be so they don't, they often don't have the time to sort of read through twenty page manuscripts sort of RCTs and things like that. So if if research is relevant to sort of our fitness crew. Um, I sort of take it, I summarize it and, and give it in sort of digestible chunks for people that they can read there. So there's a bit to learn if you want to follow my page there. Um, I'm also on ResearchGate, so I put all my research stuff that comes through there. Um, but Instagram is probably the best spot to hit me up. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure, my man. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of The School of Muscle. I really do appreciate it. Make sure to go check out Jackson's stuff. Check out my stuff at RyanJSolomon.com, and I will see you in that next episode. Oh, and screenshot it and put it on your story. Appreciate it.